This is Carl Ackerman, host of Journeys of the Mind, and we are rather lucky here today to be joined on Jimmy Carter's birthday, President Jimmy Carter, with a Carter specialist, and that's noted historian Russell Motter. Um, and Russell has uh, had a long career at Iolani School, but he's also, um, you know, done a lot of um, work on Jimmy Carter as a um, graduate student, and um, he really is a specialist in this field. So welcome, uh, Russell Motter. Thank you, Carl. Thank you for that generous introduction. Um, I, I'll have to say that my graduate school days were a long time ago, many moons. So I'll, I'll give you what I learned then and what I've learned since. You know, we've had you on before, but different for a different reason. I just wanted to ask you how your lecture series is going and your wonderful uh, African-American studies class, and I think there's another one at Mililani, but one of two in the state of Hawaii. Um, I want you to, you know, just say just briefly, you know, how those two things are going. Oh, thanks, thanks, Carl, appreciate it. Um, AP African-American studies is doing well at Iolani School, and you're right that Mililani High School is, uh, they're also offering AP African-American studies. Both of our high schools, offered the, the course last year in the second year pilot. So this year they're rolling it out nationally uh, for real. Um, I've got two full classes of eager students and um, my colleague at Mililani High School um, also has uh, two classes, I believe. And so, you know, we're, we're off to the races. Um, I, I think that the course is still in the process of being refined, but um, I think they're off to a great start and uh, students are enjoying the experience. Um, I'm glad too that you mentioned our Keebles speaker series. So this year we're offering Korean language for the first time at Iolani School. Um, it's our first class. We've got a class of, soft, uh, of freshmen, excuse me, freshmen taking the course. And so um, we're we bringing two speakers in, uh, one of whom is here today, Eric Kim, uh, who is a food writer for the New York Times, and he is just a splendid uh, food uh, writer. Um, you can find him on YouTube. He also has a best-selling book on um, on Amazon. You can pick that up. Not a plug for Amazon. You can go to Barnes and Noble or wherever you get your books. Um, it, it's a wonderful collection of stories and uh, recipes, and and. You know, you, you, you've got to read the stories to get the soul of the recipe. Um, so he's he's um, visiting us today. And then in December, uh, Kathy Park Hong, um, one of the great literary voices in our country today, um, author of a best-selling book uh, from a few years back called um, Minor Feelings, an American and an American Reckoning. Um, she's going to be with us in December. So um, we're really excited about that. And then um, in the spring, our Keebles chair this year, Elizabeth Acevedo, uh, the poet and uh, young adult author. Um, she'll be here with us from New York City. Um, so we're really looking forward to an exciting year. It's good to hear that Korean is being offered at Iwani School and that you have these two wonderful um, uh, speakers coming in. So that that's wonderful. And you may Tell them about, I think you both know somebody who's written a K-drama voyage about uh, Korean drama. They might be interested in that book. That, so, that's right. That's right. That, you got to stop by for this, Carl. <laughs> I will. I will. Um, now, let's get to the subject at hand. So, you know, as a president, um, what would you say as, you know, a scholar of Jimmy Carter, what, what were his major accomplishments and how, do, how would you describe his presidency? I'll start with this last question first. And um, I, I think in, in some respects, Carter's presidency resembled a Greek tragedy. Um, Carter came into office on the heels of Watergate. The American people's confidence in government was, I think, at an all-time low. Um, and and it, it wasn't just Watergate that provided the context for Carter's presidency, but it was also... Um, a massive failure in Vietnam, um, and it was the economy. You know, we were in double-digit inflation as Carter took office, uh, high unemployment, um, the economists, um, and low productivity as well, a lack of confidence really in um, American uh, manufacturing. Uh, you know, 
Americans were shifting to um, Japanese-made fuel-efficient automobiles at a time when Detroit was producing products that people just uh, weren't interested in buying, frankly. So the, the economists call this stagflation, and you know it was um, it was a it was an economic perfect storm, if you will, of just bad news. And so Carter inherited all of this um, uh, as he uh, entered office. Um, he presented himself to America as an honest politician, which seems, um, well, it, 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 it seems a little naive today, but you know, in the election of 1976, his promise not to lie to the American people was, I think, part of a really winning argument that Carter was making. And when Carter won the election, you know, at least the American people could say after the presidency of Richard Nixon and and also the the troubling aspects of the Vietnam War where people just simply didn't trust the government to tell them the truth. Um, you know, at least the American people could say, hey, we've elected an honest man to the government, um, to head the government. And so I, I, I think that that um, made people feel a little bit better about the country. You know, and, and I don't know if you remember this or not, Carl, but on Inauguration Day, um, Carter and his family, um, Rosalind and Amy, the daughter, you know, they got out of the limousine and, um, you know, walked and waved to the people. Um, and this was a, a great moment, I think, um, for Carter and, you know, for the country. Um, and, and, and so once he gets into office, though, you know, he's got to deal with all of these other problems. And Carter was not like um, a typical national politician. Um, he was an outsider coming in from a small Georgia town into Washington, D.C. And again, we have to remember that Washington's reputation uh, was at a low point. And there were a lot of politicians who resented Carter, that he was going to come in with his Georgia mafia, as they called it, uh, to clean up this town. And a lot of politicians who had been in D.C. for a very long time resented him, uh, resented the cocksure nature of Hamilton Jordan and Jody Powell and, and all of these other Washington outsiders. Um, and so he got off to kind of a rough start from the very beginning. And he was never able to generate the enthusiasm and the support within his own party um, to realize um, a presidency that was going to ask people to sacrifice things, uh, that was going to um, ask people to reconsider the limits of American power. One of the things that, you know, uh, as we were talking before the show, you know, we talk about um, the hostage crisis, but, you know, Jimmy Carter seems to have been very successful in several diplomatic areas. And, you know, and uh, perhaps I'm, I'm right about this. But I think that although Nixon broke open China, it was really Jimmy Carter who established the diplomatic relations between the two countries. Yes. And he also, and, and, and the Panama Canal. But can you talk a little bit about his foreign policy, especially, you know, I mean, you can also talk about his policy, policies concerning the Middle East, since that's such a hot topic right now today. Um, sure. I, you know, Carl had a, I mean, uh, Carter had an, um, a moral framework within which he was operating. And um, he was also very clear um, about his um, emphasis on human rights. He was really our first human rights president. Um, he was has always been very proud of the fact that in his four years, uh, the country did not go to war. Um, so, Carter wanted to use American power to settle longstanding problems. He was a very ambitious man generally, but I think on foreign policy, he was especially ambitious. So can you think about how, how audacious it was for 
him to invite Menachem Begin and Anwar Sadat to uh, Camp David to hammer out a peace agreement between two mortal enemies. And, you know, th this was a remarkable achievement on uh, for, for Jimmy Carter. And he did not win the Nobel Prize for this, by the way, either. Uh, Begin and Anwar Sadat did. Uh, but, you know, there were moments in that two week period where things could could have gone just south and would have come it looked like the thing was just going to fall apart, the meeting itself. But but Carter himself was relentless. And and I think as a politician, he was he was relentless as well. So some people, just as an aside, um, don't really uh, respect Carter's ability at a as a politician. And I, I think he did have some sort shortcomings um, in that regard. But his relentlessness was, I think, one of the positive features of of his own politics. And, you know, it was Carter's relentlessness that got Begin and Anwar Sadat uh, to sign that agreement. And of course, we all know that Anwar Sadat paid with his life for that agreement. And, and Carter, even to this day, of course, um, is a controversial figure. You know, when it comes to matters in the Middle East, um, he holds fast to this, you know, idea of a Palestinian state um, while at the same time uh, recognizing the commitment to to keep Israel uh, viable as a nation state as well. Your talking today has made me um, rethink about something. And that is, perhaps that agreement was the critical agreement in terms of Israel um, uniting with its Arab neighbors. And, you know, it, we've talked about the Abraham Accords most recently under Donald Trump and um, his son-in-law. Um, but, you know, all of that, perhaps, and I'm going to ask you this question, would not have been possible without the initial um, agreement with Egypt. As you're speaking, Carl, um, I'm thinking, too, that there were a lot of um, Middle Eastern states that did not want to see Anwar Sadat make this deal. Um, and I wonder if this is a tale not just of possibility, um, but perhaps a tale of caution as well. And, um, you know, the reality is that there are um, terrible obstacles that the Middle East presents to peacemakers. And, um, you know, I, I, I wonder if um, what Anwar Sadat actually did was demonstrate how difficult that process is, um, how intractable some of these problems seem to be. I mean, right now we're on the verge of a war in the Middle East. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm not sure what is in front of us on that. Um, you know, we had been on the verge of a deal between the Saudis and the state of Israel. Um, could could such a deal happen in, in the near future? I, I just don't know. Um, you know, I, I, historians make terrible prognosticators, but yes. we, we can tell you where we've been and where we are at the moment. Well, speaking about that, another foreign policy, many people would say success. Um, in terms of our, our connections with Latin America, um, was the whole Panama issue. And I, and I would like you to frame that issue um, within the context of what was going on at that particular, during the Jimmy Carter presidency. Sure. I, you know, I think we've got to frame it in the context of the limits of American power that Carter was really cognizant of in developing that foreign policy. Again, there was a massive failure in Vietnam. Um, there was, uh, even though it wasn't a foreign policy issue, um, we did have um, Watergate there too. That had, in, in, well, Nixon was tied up with Vietnam, and 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 you know Watergate uh, was, um, you know, w Watergate showed the dishonesty of Richard Nixon. Um, Nixon um, was dishonest about the conduct 
of the Vietnam War. Um, Nixon's uh, Secretary of State and um, Security Council head, uh, Henry Kissinger, had some unfortunate dealings in Latin America as well. I mean, we remember Salvador Allende in, in Chile. Um, and so Carter had a special affinity for Latin America. Um, you know, Carter read passages from the Bible at night in, in Spanish um, before going to bed. And um, I, I, I think that, um, that, that in, in many ways, Panama was a bit of a prism through which Carter viewed Latin American foreign policy. That um, when Theodore Roosevelt uh, acquired the Panama Canal uh, way back in the early 20th century, um, he, he, he did so by giving a green light to Panamanian revolutionaries after Colombia refused to, to sell the canal, uh, or at least the land where the canal was going to be um, built, refused to, to sell it to Americans on the terms that Theodore Roosevelt wanted. And, you know, this was the high point of um, American imperialism, if we want to call it that, and I, I think it's an accurate label. Um, and, and so Carter just wanted to return uh, a piece of land to Panama that he thought was wrongfully acquired. Um, I, I'm not sure if this was an atonement um, that Carter was seeking. Um, I do think that Carter believed it was good politics, uh, given the um, the situation in Latin America that he inherited. He thought it would be a, a, a move that would stabilize and make useful American power in that region. Um, politically, he was asking senators to sign off on a deal that would be very, very unpopular um, at home for many of these senators. Um, and so part of this was part of a very ambitious first year agenda that Jimmy Carter had. And it was a big ask, as we say today, um, for these senators. And he had to do some arm twisting. And um, he got it, he got it through Congress. Well, he got it through the Senate. The Senate ratifies all treaties. And it was passed. But it became an albatross for Carter in 1980 when Ronald Reagan would claim that, hey, he gave away our canal. Um, and he also refused to um, engage in the horse trading that a guy like Lyndon Johnson was so adept at in the Senate and as president. Carter just simply wasn't built that way. And when Carter refused to return favors after having asked senators to sign off on such a controversial piece of legislation, a controversial treaty, um, it didn't bode well for his future. Before we get on to what you think his legacy is, because he lived, he's lived so long past his presidency and he's done so many uh, philanthropic, philanthropic things. Um, tell us about his, his love of rock and roll also, because this was, oh, this is kind of, this kind of humanizes yeah. him. I'm so glad that you asked about this because, um, you know, Carter presented himself to the public as, as kind of a Renaissance man. And, um, he was kind of a hip guy um, as governor of Georgia. And I, I think that he had a lot of very young people on his staff as governor, a lot of young people on his staff at the White House. Um, I think he genuinely liked um, the music of the Allman Brothers and the Marshall Tucker Band, that whole Southern rock genre was very much a part of the Atlanta scene in the 1970s. He was a fan of, of Bob Dylan, but uh, he said he was also a fan of the poetry of Dylan Thomas. Um, so, you know, that was a way that Carter, I, I think, presented himself as relevant. 
Um, I remember going at, as a young man attending a, a concert by the Marshall Tucker Band uh, at the Fox Theater in Atlanta, Georgia, and it was a fundraiser for his presidential campaign uh, back in 1975. And you know, I, Carter was a virtual unknown when he announced a, a run for the presidency. Uh, I remember him appearing on What's My Line, the old television show. Uh, where the panel had to guess the occupation uh, of of the person in front of them, and they didn't know who Jimmy Carter was. Carter had uh, about a two percent name recognition uh, rate rate when when he announced uh, he was running for president. And I remember as a kid, as a teenager, I, I wasn't particularly well informed on political matters when I was a young man in high school. But I do remember thinking to myself, what is he thinking? You know, he, there's no way this guy's going to get elected president. And sure enough, um, he did. He used all of this um, as an asset uh, in his presidential run. Well, I think that, you know, I, uh, I think, you know, um, in terms of legacy, I mean, you know, Bill Clinton sort of did the same thing. Um, um, he was a little bit better known, but he was um, he was actually someone who was um uh uh that followed jimmy carter's um uh sort of pathway and things like that um what what can you tell us russell about um jimmy carter and his legacy after the presidency and i i want to um point out also that you know in order to get elected he had to beat down the ted kennedy machine because as i remember ted kennedy was also wanting to run for president well, and, Ted uh, Kennedy was running for president in 1980, and I will never forget that humiliating, um, that humiliating picture of Jimmy Carter having to chase Ted Kennedy around the stage for a handshake. Now, I, you know, again, I, I, I've got to tell you a little story about Ted Kennedy and uh, Jimmy Carter. Um, when Jimmy Carter was president in 1974. Uh, it was Law Day at the University of Georgia, and uh, Ted Kennedy was an invited speaker. And uh, Jimmy Carter was there as governor, and he made a speech as well. And uh, Carter's speech really focused on the time uh, for racism in this country has come to an end. And he totally upstaged Ted Kennedy in that speech. And I don't think Ted Kennedy ever forgot it. Um, you know, Ted Kennedy uh, also recognized uh, Carter's weaknesses, of course, in in 1980, but I don't think there was a whole lot of love lost between those two men. Well, yeah, both were very ambitious men, and so were uh, Ted Kennedy's brothers, who did a lot of good for the United States. But um, of course, her father was uh, was was the ultimate ruthless character. So, uh, Joe, um, so what do you think was most significant about um, Jimmy Carter post um, his? Uh, presidency, and you know, he sort of uh, uh, laid a pathway for other presidents in sort of doing good works and philanthropy, etc. There's been no more successful post presidency than that of Jimmy Carter's, and uh, you know, Carter always took his faith very, very seriously. He put his money where his mouth is, literally. Um, he he wanted to do good and he did good uh, all over the world he supervised elections um he uh he he made made people's lives better by building housing and providing uh medicine uh for people who needed it um he stayed engaged in matters of foreign policy and helped when he could. Sometimes his interventions were resented by um, his his, uh, his his the people who succeeded him in the White House, notably Bill Clinton. Um, so yeah, I I think that Carter's post presidency um, is is what we remember most about Jimmy Carter. Um, he's become widely admired within the party. Um, which is a little bit ironic uh, since, you know, Carter was very, very toxic for Democratic politicians uh, all the way up through Barack Obama. 
So, um, you know, it's it's nice to see that Democrats are re-embracing him, but it's largely due to his post-presidency. Although though I would argue that there, there were things that he did in his presidency that he hasn't been recognized for. Um, you know, I think Carter was looking way ahead um, when he promoted new sources of energy. He had a, an energy plan that was very, very controversial at a time when energy prices were really high and he was looking toward the future. Um, he didn't get past what he wanted um, because, again, it was requiring Americans to conserve energy um, and, you know, asking Americans to pay more for energy. Uh, you know, that was one thing. Um, I, I think Carter's deregulation of the economy uh, proceeded in a way that was going to lay the groundwork for Reagan to claim those kinds of successes. Um, he deregulated natural gas so that people in the North were not paying exorbitant um, prices for, for natural gas, where people in natural gas rich places in the South were buying it very, very cheaply, which didn't make any sense, you know, especially in the energy crisis of the 1970s. Um, he made government accountable um, because he made himself accountable. You know, when, um, when, when the helicopters went down in the desert of Iran for that hostage rescue in 1980, he took full responsibility for that. And politically, that was a, a, a tough thing for him to do. But a, as a person who wanted and had pledged to be honest, you know, you look back at that speech and and you can see that he took he was the one who took responsibility for what happened in that desert. And the failure of that mission. You had mentioned, besides his honesty, you know, his Habilitat for Humanity, which has built so many houses in the United States and other places. And so, um, you know, he's he's firmly associated with this. Now, um, I'm, I'm going to ask you one last question, and that is, um, well, a brief question, I because I don't know the answer to this. Did he take Georgia in 1980? Um, was he? Was, did he get? Did he win the state? Let me ask you in a broader question. Do you think having a a president who came from Georgia has allowed for the um, for the you know sort of purple image of Georgia and because you're a native son and you grew up in the suburbs of Atlanta yeah um you know what do you think about this and you know is there a link between uh Jimmy Carter and Kamala Harris in terms of making the state a little bit more tenable i mean the way um uh, you know uh, uh Joe Biden did and you know cuz Joe Biden won that election and of course there's that famous call by Donald Trump to the, one of the key electors uh, uh, about changing the votes there. But what do you think about that? Is there a strong connection there? Jimmy Carter appointed more Black people, more women to positions um, of power in the federal government than any president up to that time. Um, he did that, too, in the state of Georgia. You know, so I think that there are a lot of Black people in Georgia and in the South generally who remember Carter for that, a lot of older black people. Um, but we've got to remember that um, the Reagan revolution turned the deep South red. And um, Jimmy Carter was, I think in many ways, persona non grata um, with those politicians who left the Democratic Party in Georgia and in the deep South and turned Republican. Um, you know, uh, a, a man like Newt Gingrich, for example, who um, represented uh, Cobb County um, in, I guess, the late 80s and, and, and the early 90s, um, he had nothing good to say about Jimmy Carter. So, you know, again, I think, you know, part of the tragedy of Carter's political career was that the Democratic Party, not just in the South, um, but nationally, really disowned him, um, you know, for a very long time. What drew you to Jimmy Carter? I mean, there are plenty of reasons that you've outlined in this interview, but what drew you as a as a Southerner? Um, you know, most people who are listening to this today will pick up on your Southern accent, slight as, as it may be now. Um, uh, uh, 
I always remember you teaching me the expression, knock you into the next room, which I hadn't heard before. Next up week, on the knock you into next oh, week, Carl. Knock, knock you into next week. Sorry, mm -hmm. <laughs> see you, see. Um, but um, what, what drew you to Jimmy Carter? I think Carter pushing against um, the grain in Washington, D.C. in the 70s um, was a powerful statement. Um, I'll, I'll always remember his uh, speech of 1979 um, when he talked about a crisis of confidence. And um, now this too was a very controversial speech because the country was at a low point. Carter himself was at a low point. Um, he had done a lot of reflecting and a lot of talking to people in um, various uh, places in the country, gone off to Camp David, and and then, you know, came down off the mountain, and and asked American people to think of their country and not themselves, um, and it it was a it was a poisonous speech for Carter as a politician. People loved it when they initially heard it, but when the pundits got a hold of it and began dissecting it, um, you know, it seemed as if Carter was wagging his finger at, uh, you know, at the country. Um, and, and I think that was the takeaway from that. I don't think that's what he intended, um, but, you know, he, he wanted the country to move toward a higher plane. Um, and and that's what I think I ad, I admired him for. Thank you, um, Mr. Russell Motter um, of Iolani School and that wonderful Keebles chair and also um, teaching an Af African-American studies class. We really thank you for coming here today to Think at Tech Hawaii to talk about Jimmy Carter on his 100th birthday here on October 1st. Thank you very much. And we know that you're a native Georgian and uh, a guy that grew up in the suburbs of Atlanta. Could you just move back a little bit because you got that Braves Braves shirt on? There we go. Gotta go so, get them Braves now. I gotta go get them Braves. And because you're rooting for the Braves, I'll probably follow you since my San Francisco Giants are not in. Again, we are so grateful uh, Thank to you, Carl. Russell Russell Motter for sparing his time in talking about the wonderful president Jimmy Carter. Ahui ho! This is all from Think Tech Hawaii and Journeys of the Mind. I'm Carl Ackerman.